go. And we are officially live only on OneDealAway.com, broadcasting out of Providence, Rhode Island. This is Money Matters. My name is Nev, and today is Monday. It's last week of August 2020. Y'all, we are approaching fourth quarter, which means we're approaching elections. We're approaching end of the year, and who knows what 2021 will bring. I know that many people are beyond excited to leave 2020 behind, but before you celebrate, don't celebrate too soon because we still have quite a few months left to go. And future is all but certain. And that is what we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be discussing a tweet that came out of Robert Kiyosaki. And he tweeted that the major banking crisis is coming fast and you should go into gold, silver, Bitcoin and do you have it? So I wanted to dig deeper and find out why he would tweet something like this. Is this just a way to freak out everybody or is there some sort of truth to what's going on in the financial markets? I wanted to find that out. I wanted to share that with you. And that is exactly what we have here in today's episode where we're going to be talking a couple of different articles one is the three truths that will find this three-part economy and the other one is called the looming bank collapse and that is what we're going to be discussing today in this episode so i hope that you are excited to be here now i know you're not excited about the doom and gloom that we're about to share fair enough I'm not either, but I hope you're excited to be here to learn, to start thinking, well, what are the probabilities and potential that this could happen and how do I protect my money, protect my wealth, protect myself and my family? And that is the goal of Money Matters and that is the purpose behind One Deal Away is to provide education and guidance for folks not just to preserve their wealth but potentially increase it incredibly well. And this crisis like every other crisis, has two sides of it. One is failure and dismay and, and depression and fear. And on the other side of it is opportunity. And our job is to take a look at what's going on and how do we create whatever it is that is going on into an opportunity. I do want to welcome everybody watching this live on OneDealAway.com. And if you're watching this on YouTube or anywhere well else, smash that like button right now. Do subscribe, hit the bell button so you get notified every single day that a show shows up on YouTube. And that is, well, just about every single day unless some sort of something weird happens to me. So don't worry. I don't plan on anything weird happening, but you know, sometimes, sometimes I got to go and travel or do some stuff and it, it keeps me away from it. But for the most part, we've been doing this live. I'm going to keep on doing this live on daily basis or as regular to daily basis as humanly possible. So every single day at 7 a.m. we go live only on OneDealAway.com. So let's do this. All right, all right, all right. So here we go. I hope you're excited about what we're going to talk about um, and be able to learn how to protect your wealth, how to protect your money when it comes to really, you know, all of the stuff that folks are calling for and what people believe is going to happen. So here we go. Let me uh, uh, share my screen with you so that you can see uh, you can see what I see. Do you see what I see? Um, and this is coming from uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. I, I, I know you can't see it. And uh, let me see if I can. I don't know how to move this stuff. So my apologies. Anyways, um, what you will see over here is this right over here. Why Buffett is out of banks. Bank, banks bankrupt. Major banking cam uh, cr a crisis coming fast. Fed and Treasury to take over banking system. Fed and Treasury helicopter fake money direct to people to avoid mass rioting. Not a time to think about it. How much gold, silver, Bitcoin do you have? And uh, as you can see, I'm not making it up that it is because people are uh, people are replying to the real at the real uh, um, Robert Kiyosaki, and you can see that people are kind of going in 
and uh, you know they are just going in and out and some are saying you know you're right some are saying you know uh, fake news uh, you know how dare you say that stuff um, you know <laughs> somebody's saying you know you've been saying this since 2011 and I'm going uh, okay yeah so anyways uh, anyways so people are kind of going back and forth and as you can see it's controversial um, but it's always controversial so what will actually happen look none of us really know all right none of us really know what exactly is going to happen what we do know is that there are some severe challenges uh, right we can agree to this piece that there are some severe challenges happening in the economy right um, we've talked about it here on this channel and uh, you know my position on the gold on the Bitcoin on the uh, cryptocurrencies as a whole so it's not just crypto uh, uh, it's not just Bitcoin it's really cryptocurrencies as a whole so um, I'm, n I'm not shy about the whole thing and uh, do I think that he is right well <coughs> excuse me I don't know um, I brought water hold on should have done that before we went live but there goes that um, I don't know I don't know if he's right right like it's it's impossible to predict the future but there's definitely certain things that are looming on the horizon and uh, I want to share with you what I have been able to find of like why would somebody you know share this now is it possible that he's using this to you know uh, sell his products sure is it possible that he's using this to promote his channel and and what he's doing absolutely you know uh, but is it also possible that he sees something uh, that maybe other people don't and I think that is a possibility just as much now I do agree that you should have some Bitcoin and silver and gold and maybe even a little bit of cash and uh, you know uh, uh, but uh, you know not a financial advice so what we're about to share over here is not financial advice as always in these shows you have got to do your own research your own conclusions if you need financial advice find somebody who is certified to do that and can legally give you that advice and do me a favor when you do that stuff when you look for somebody to give you financial advice make sure that they are doing what they tell you to do that they eat their own cooking as they say because many times you will find these advisors and uh, they don't do anything that you tell them to do you know um, they don't they don't invest in things that they tell you to invest they don't buy in things that they tell you to buy and again we all have different financial pictures so what makes sense for me might not make sense for you but um, overall sort of picture is looking at are they really in there just to make money to sell you into a particular asset or are they truly um, actually inside uh, on the on the thing right like uh, do they really believe like if they tell you to buy Tesla do are they buying Tesla themselves or is just that something that they have been told by the company to peddle over so that's really my biggest uh, gripe with the whole thing now here is a couple of the news that um, you know and I apologize again for a really weird display but this is Forbes and we already discussed that uh, I don't know how to work this darn thing so the true three truths that will define this three-part economy and uh, the economy recovery yeah okay so there are three truths that will define this economic recovery this is going to change the way we live well duh um, and we're seeing things already changing saving increasing spending changing and it is going to continue to change our spending and saving habits right so we used to live uh, heavily and rely heavily on the consumer spending right now that consumer spending is not happening as much uh, mostly because consumers don't really have as much money right so that's part of the big problem is that there's not much money happening and uh, you know the money that is being printed right now in trillions is actually going to the big corporations it's going to the big banks and it's going to the wealthy and the problem with that multiple problems with that is that wealthy are already getting money elsewhere right so they're doing fine to begin with this is just giving them an ability to continue to drive asset prices higher that's why we've seen the asset prices go higher because this money has to go somewhere but it's not hitting the lower uh, income population and that is the population that spends um, so you know years ago I had learned about the whole like you know 
what do you call somebody that invests, right? And they say investor. And what do you call somebody that spends? And they say the spender. And what do you call somebody that saves? A saver. And what does saver do? Well, they save, right? And what does spender do? Well, they spend. So it's one of those things that certain populations do what, well, what they do, right? I mean, somebody's a jerk because they make jerk moves and jerks do jerky things. So why do you get angry at it? Um, so it's one of those things that it's kind of interesting that, you know, expect for people to do what they're meant to do. And so spenders are supposed to spend. And a lot of the lower income class, well, is a uh, uh, lower income because they spend. And uh, not everybody, not everybody, but many. And uh, the reason I kind of say that is because I have seen it over and over and over again, and I used to do it as well. And it takes a long time to change your habits around, your, uh, around money and around anything, right? But the moment you decide that what I'm doing is wrong, it goes like this. But until you do that and until you have a very honest conversation with yourself, it's very, very challenging and very rough to do that stuff. So I've seen people go in, you know, they'll get this stimulus check that kind of came in, right? And it's, it was meant to stimulate the economy and, you know, to a degree I think it did. Some people actually went in and uh, took that portion of the money and, uh, you know, invested it. Some people took that portion of the money and paid down their debt. And some people went out and bought, like, extra TVs and, uh, you know, a uh, car audio system. Trust me, I know it. I live next to one, um, and it was just busy. They Their business has gone down since, uh, um, you know, it was very interesting because everything was shut down. So here's here's an interesting thing, and, um, you know, you let me know what you think about it, but here's, here's a really uh, a sincere and honest story and kind of where we are right now. So when we first shut down, obviously, the, the, the car audio place was shut down as well. Then they kind of started to reopen, and when the stimulus check kind of started to come in, the weather started to be nice, and next thing you know is cars started coming out of Wazoo. I mean, they were so busy. There was a line down the street of people waiting to install the brand-new audio system in their car. Now, some cars were really nice. Most of them were kind of junky, but they were all getting, like, top of the line um, audio system put into it. So that's an interesting component. But then we, um, you know, I was wondering, I'm like, well, once, uh, you know, the $1,200, like surely this is done and over with, but they continue to come in. Well, they were still getting $1,200 or $1,600 a month extra, right? Because it's that $600 uh, um, a week a payment. So um, actually, no, my math is wrong. So 600 and 600, right? That's 2,400 dollars um, extra a month so they were still coming in lining around the block now what ended up happening is that roughly about a month ago um, almost to the date a month ago the um, yeah almost to the date a month ago these extra six hundred dollars a, a week has disappeared right and slowly but surely I am noticing that their business is starting to dwindle and uh, it's it's again it's anecdotal right it's one business or one person but because i'm right there i see it all the time um you know i walk by it on a daily basis multiple times a day every time i come and go it's right there so i get to see it and so this is the part of what i see looming and it's changing everything right they talked about it's going to change everything well it's changing everything so this is one of those things. This crisis is simply the greatest demand destruction of our lifetimes, and everything is going to be repriced. Inflation numbers and measures are going to be warped at, for at least a few years, and we're going to have to come up with a new model to evaluate everything. Do expect 10% employment or higher or something close to it in the middle of 2021. So it's going to last a while. Hotels will come back eventually. The question is who is going to own them? private equity owners or the new ones at what price right how what is going to happen with the malls who is going to own them and how are they going to be repurposed what's going to happen with the airline companies or all of those planes who's going to own them where are they going to be so a lot of questions not a lot of answers inequality is not going to get any better however more than probable we will see some form of universal basic income in the future I have been saying that this is coming. There's no way that it doesn't come because it has to, right? But I've been also saying that some of the other stuff has to come, and it hasn't quite come yet, 
but there is a still a high probability and high potential that it might just happen so that's that's one of the things to kind of expect and then final piece is we have two major cycles coming into play at the same time in this decade end of the fourth turning is always the time of great social unrest and we are just at the beginning of the end now over here if you don't know what the fourth turning is it's actually name of a book that was written quite some time ago that really basically called what we are experiencing right now and if you are interested to learn a little bit more about the fourth turning uh, there is a, a you can actually look it up on YouTube there's quite a few different videos that talk about it so that's an interesting one um, I can't remember the name of the authors but if you look for the fourth turning it's the same authors that wrote the generations book uh, which has been a book that has been highly recommended by uh, Tony Robbins as one of the like books that one should read uh, an 80 year old cycle and a 50 year old cycle are also coming and both highly disruptive and they are actually coming uh, at the same time and uh, later this decade and this is also coming from the book by George Friedman who has written a co book called the storm before the calm America's discord uh, the coming crisis of the 2020s and the triumph beyond so we're about to experience ugly, ugly stuff, um, as they are saying, in the in this decade. But after that, if you survive it, it is going to be absolutely amazing. My goal for us, I don't know. I keep trying, y'all. I keep trying. I keep losing. Okay. My goal for you and for me is that together we not just survive the 2020s, but thrive in them and that we roll into 2030s stronger healthier better wealthier more educated more excited more vigorous than ever before so that's my goal for you and i for this decade so we're gonna do this together all right um, massive corporate debt and multiple pension crisis will boggle the mind so this is what we can expect and uh, you might or might not know that we are expecting massive corporate debt and uh, you know a pension crisis left right and sideways why is pension crisis so let's uh let's do something um over here together whoa baby i am not quite sure what happened here that's not supposed to happen that is not supposed to happen hold on I have no clue what's going on, y'all. I got nothing. All right. Clearly, we're not going to do that stuff. We're not going to be using this extension. My apologies. Um, so anyways, um, the, the reason that there is massive corporate debt and, and multiple pension crisis is because they, we have one of the largest populations. They're all going to retire. Some are going to retire uh, prematurely. Some are going to post maturely, but they're all going to have to retire. And when you have more sellers than buyers, that's one reason for the crash. The second one is what we're experiencing with, you know, right now we're sort of this super bubble territory. We've been talking about the Warren uh, Buffett index, right? The Buffett index um, and the, the measure of where we are. And it's at 170 percent. So super bubblicious um, because, you know, the stock markets are super high up. There's no earnings. There's a lot of losses bankruptcies are being filed everywhere we talk about it all the time here in show so all of that stuff is coming in and of course they're saying well all of this that must be rationalized and i'm like well yeah i agree with it but you know no idea of how to do that stuff so i think that uh, what is going to happen is that it's going to you know change a lot of the perspective of a lot of people and uh, this is the reason why kiyosaki is talking about the bankruptcies and the bank crisis and that kind of stuff and we're going to go super deep into this stuff yeah to finish this forbes article um here's basically what he's saying i'm excited about the future i'm excited about the future um, right now everything everything that is happening has its opportunities and as you know he the author here is saying quote as my dad would say don't let the bastards meaning the crisis around you get you down do not allow negative media stuff to get you down to get you into the fear 
I share some of the stuff here with you right now and today not to scare you, not to petrify you, but to get you excited to start thinking about how do I position myself, how do I prepare myself, what are some of the opportunities that exist out there. Look for the opportunity. There is a pony in there somewhere, and if you don't know the pony story, I'm going to tell it to you right now very, very quickly. Um, so before, before I go there, I'm just going to finish with this, and I'm going to tell you the pony story. I promise that by the end of it, we're doing the pony story. I predict an unprecedented crisis that will lead to the biggest wipeout of wealth in history. And most investors are completely unaware of the pressure building right now. And that is the reason why we're doing this show right now and today. And I want to go in and start talking about this looming collapse that we are experiencing, that we are seeing, that we are right now in the epicenter of. Now, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but I think it is important. Now, we've covered a lot of this stuff already, um, but I think it's even more important now to talk about it because we're getting more information, more news, and sometimes you hear something once, and then it kind of goes in your ear, you know, in one ear, out the other, and you forget it altogether. So here is the story out of Atlantic, the looming bank collapse. Toll it has taken on the economy, broken supply chains, record unemployment, failing small businesses. We've seen it all. But there's another looming uh, threat to the economy that is much bigger than anything else. And it's the balance sheets of the banks that could be cataclysmic. It could wipe out the entire financial industry. But it comes with a twist. And here I will share with you my opinion of the twist of how this could potentially play out once we get there. So stay tuned in. Financial crisis of 2008 was about home mortgages. Hundreds of billions of dollars of loans to homes were packaged into securities called the collateral debt obligations, the CDOs. Remember those things? And they were theory being, you know, um, they were packaged together then they were going to be sold to investors so that it takes the risk out of the banks, out of the lenders, into somebody else except they were getting really good returns. Remember, everybody's chasing yield. You gotta keep that in mind. Everybody's chasing yield. So they started to sell it, but they couldn't resist it, so they bought it too. So they were holding on to it as well. So the in theory it was supposed to basically be that, hey, none of these things are going to fail at the same stuff. We had the tranches, if we remember, from like the least risky to the most risky, and then they were kind of packaged together and everybody was jumping in. The pension funds, the insurance, the, the, the uh, uh, venture, uh, uh, venture capitalists, the hedge managers, the individuals were buying them. I mean, it was all over the place and it's just a derivative, right? Like everything else, but we talk about the fact that the derivative market is the largest market that there is and it's the scariest one and the challenge is that it's the shadow one as well because you don't know exactly what all is in it. It's so uh, financially engineered um, that it's almost impossible to like figure out where's the tail, where's the head, right? So anyways, they were kind of going in, they were selling this whole stuff, then they went in and of course what happened is in late 2007, it started actually, you know, things started like being shaky. People started kind of like selling stuff. It wasn't in, you know, one thing led to another. We had an implosion and boom, we had a crash, right? Remember that? Then in 2010, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act and under the new rule, the banks were supposed to borrow less. Um, they were supposed to make a fewer long-term um, bets. Uh, they had to be transparent about their holdings. They had to, you know, sort of like disclose some of the stuff. They, you know, uh, the Fed started doing the stress tests. You heard about them. And, uh, you know, they started to reform the credit agencies because they were saying, well, credit agencies shouldn't have called this triple A. If it wasn't triple A, they didn't do their job correctly. So anyways, this whole thing kind of came in and unraveled and like things were starting to move in. Over the course of the crisis, more than 13,000 CDOs, investments that were rated AAA, the highest possible rating defaulted. So these were never supposed to default because the belief was that, well, you know, they're all over the nation. They come in all these different things. You know, real estate never goes down. 
just like you know some of our uh, folks are saying oh the stocks never go down uh, yes everything goes down everything goes down and it has the potential to and when it does it really can super fast so the demand shifted and uh, since since then of course uh, CDOs nobody wants the CDOs anymore because they have a bad name so the demand shifted and a new thing started to pop in CLOs collateralized loan obligations and we've talked about it here on this channel I've been talking about it a few different times as that being probably the next uh, not really black swan because we know that it's coming I mean the the beer overflow that we've been experiencing since March and in some places since December right um, around the world uh, you know that was the black swan but this you know we know about it it's just looming and waiting for it to happen so a CLO walks and talks like a CDO but in place of loans made to home buyers are loans made to businesses specifically you need to remember this troubled businesses so it's not the performing businesses it's the zombie businesses the subprime mortgage of the corporate world loans are made to companies that have maxed out their borrowing and can no longer sell bonds directly to investors or qualify for traditional bank loan more than one trillion worth of leveraged loans currently outstanding the majority held in CLOs okay so keep that in mind this is the looming this is the the, the 500,000 pound gorilla waiting to attack um, two securities are si remarkably alike like CDO CLO has multiple layers which are sold separately remember the tranches and then the bottom layer is the riskiest the top is the safest and you know if just a few of the loans default you know the bottom uh, layer will suffer a bit of a loss while the other layers will remain the same you've heard the story exactly the same like CDO stuff and uh, but you know it's only if you start getting you know a uh, uh, higher level of the defaults uh, that are coming in they will actually start to kind of climb up the stairs and start affecting everybody now that's what happened with the CDOs but they're saying well this time is different remember when somebody tells you this time is different run it's never different it's always the same now the names might change the years might change the titles might change the percentages might change but it's not exactly different it might be you know not exactly the same but it's not different I can tell you that the CLO market is bigger than the subprime mortgage CDO Bank of International Settlements had estimated the overall size of the CDO market in 2007 was 640 billion dollars remember that number 640 billion dollars at the height of it right before it all went away right that was the CDO that was the thing that we've experienced now the CLO in 2018 so two years ago was 750 billion since then it is estimated that more than 130 billion dollars worth of CLOs have been created and um, it's possible that it's even more than that and many of them in recent months so in 2020 so now we're looking at about a trillion dollars plus minus I would say it's more uh, because a lot of this stuff is in the shadows and it, it, data is impossible to find and a lot of it is hidden and we'll talk about how exactly they hide it legally okay legally hiding it because you know there there there's a law that allows you to do that stuff and of course many of the individuals will you know you utilize the fullest uh, uh, amount of the law that you're given CLOs have been praised by Federal Reserve uh, Chair Jerome Powell and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin for moving the risk of, of leverage loans outside the banking system now what does this sound like well Greenspan way back uh, uh, when also said that hey these prime mortgage stuff that's not a big deal at all they are smart about it it's not even sitting on their books this is the safest thing you could invest in hey pension funds you should jump in on this hey insurances you should jump in on this and they all did does it sound different it sounds pretty same to me so anyways uh, you can see the, the the parallels running so far across the globe banks held at least 250 billion worth of CLOs at the end of 2018 after Powell declared in a press conference that the risk isn't in the banks 
Two economists from the Federal Reserve reported that the U.S. depository institution and their holding companies owe them mo mo uh, owned more than $110 billion worth of CLOs issued out of the Cayman Islands alone. Banks have been consistent uh, have been inconsistent about reporting the CLO holdings. <coughs> Excuse me, and the Financial Stability Board warned in December of 2019 that 14 percent of CLOs, more than 100 billion worth, are unaccounted for. So here's where the problems lie, right? So you have the fact that they're hiding it. Again, we're going to cover how. Then they're not quite reporting it. They're very inconsistent of what they report and how. Uh, these things are very, very well hidden on the balance sheet, and many of them live off the balance sheet. And you're like, how can something live off the balance sheet? Isn't that illegal? Well, not really, and I'll explain in a moment how and why. So all of this stuff that is happening, right? So one of the things that we have learned is that um, the Wells Fargo is, and the bank's uh, most recent uh, annual reporting uh, on page 144 they were uh, they were the investments basically that were available for sale account and uh, the list basically uh, was sharing some of the assets such as treasury bonds municipal bonds and that kind of stuff but then it also had uh, collateralized loan and other obligations that's the CLOs and it turned out that at the time when this was kind of looked into this is uh, you know uh, um, I think it was like a few years back, the ba Wells Fargo Bank had a total of $29.7 billion in CLOs inside the bank holding on to the stuff. Now, we don't know which tranche, but that's a different story. 30 globally, syst globally systemically important banks, the average exposure to leverage loans and CLOs was roughly 60% of capital on hand. This is coming out of a report from Financial Stability Board, and they are estimating just about every systemically. Now, what is what is a systemically important bank? Well, that's a bank that is super large, that is connected to many other banks, that if it goes down, it actually could take the whole system down. An example of that bank would be Deutsche Bank. Another example of that bank would be J.P. Morgan. Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is the same thing, sorry. J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Citigroup, Bank of America, right? Like, so think of a really large bank that is a systematically important banks because they're systematically intertwined with each other. And if one goes down, it's kind of like, um, think of like everybody being like tied together, right? Um, if you have ever watched like, uh, you know, sheep or donkeys or whatever, right? When they're like, climbing or going up and down the mar uh, mountain, maybe over on the, in the Grand Canyon, if you ever went to see it there live, right? And you have all of these donkeys, they're all like tied with the rope and stuff. And the problem is that like, if one of them goes over the cliff, the rest of them are coming right with them. So that's exactly what happens here with the banks. They're all tied together. If one goes, they're all basically going straight into the abyss as well. Defenders of the CLO, say that, the, they, uh, that these things are a sure thing as you can hope for. This is not a gamble. Banks mostly own the le least risky top layer of CLOs. And since the mid-1990s, the highest annual default rate on leveraged loans was about 10% during the previous financial crisis. Now, if a 10% default, then the bottom layers will suffer, but the top layer is going to be fine. You're not even going to notice any of that stuff. And, uh, you know, that's that's it's, it's going to be fine. No, you shouldn't worry about it. Why are you even bringing it up? Who cares? You know, this is not a big deal. Why are you, you know, why are you freaking out, as they say, right? So the securities structure is such that the investor with high tolerance for risk, like hedge funds and private equity firms, buys the bottom layer, hoping to win the lottery, and the big banks settle for smaller returns and the security at the top layer, right, the top tranche. As of this writing, there's no triple A layer, uh, rated layer of CLO that has ever lost principal. So people are using that. They're using historic and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like these are triple A. These are good. They have never lost the principal. You know, even at the worst crisis when we had this, which was in 2008, CLOs were doing just fine. But CLOs were not the flavor of the year. You have to remember that. So that's one, right? Number two, that was a mortgage crisis, not a business crisis, right? So many businesses, yeah, 
I mean, we've experienced some of the, the troubles and that kind of stuff, but many businesses were just fine, right? Like we weren't shut down for months on end globally like we are now. So there's a lot of people run a lot of parallels that are saying using exactly the same, but it's not exactly the same. It's different, right? And you got to keep that in mind as well, that it is different in that regard, that it is much bigger right now and much riskier. When the economy went down last time, which was in 2008, 2009, that kind of stuff, remember? I mean, we were down like what, like eight, nine percent GDP loss, right? We were down what, 40 percent in, in a second quarter here for 2020. So you cannot compare it and say that it's exactly the same because it's not. CLOs were almost non-existent at that time. OK, so and now they are huge. And, uh, uh, you know, and the crisis was way, 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 way less and affected very different sort of market area, whereas this puppy is destroying everything. But let's continue learning. Now, um, credit rating agencies grade CLOs and their underlying debt separately. You might assume that the CLO must contain AAA uh, debt if top layer is traded AAA. However, that's not the case. CLOs are made up of loans to businesses that are already in trouble, right? So if a business is in trouble, they're not triple rated. They might be B rated or maybe triple C or lower rated. So that's highly problematic. Fitch rating has estimated that it's in April, uh, more than 67% of the 1,745 borrowers in its leverage loan database had a B rating. B rating is lousy. It is not good because you remember, we go triple A, double A, single A, triple B, double B, single B, triple C, double C, gone. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm serious, uh, you know, semi joking, but I'm, I'm actually very serious about it. So B is not good. B is not like, um, you know, B in school where you were like doing well, you know, think of uh, you know, triple A as A, double A as B, triple A as C, triple B is D, double B is F, and then I, I don't know what is what comes in, in school grades after F, like suspended? Is that is that what it is? You get kicked out of school. So you have to you have to change your thinking about what this B means. B rated borrower's ability to repay a loan is likely to be impaired in adverse business or economic conditions. This is coming to the rating agencies. This is what they say. If somebody is B rating uh, their debt, then they um, uh, their ability to repay in adverse business or economic conditions is like not going to happen. Well, what are we experiencing now? I would say we're definitely experiencing adverse business and economic conditions, not or and economic conditions. 15% of the companies with leveraged loans are rated lower still at triple C or below. These borrowers are on the cusp of default. And many of these businesses, as we're going to discuss in a moment, have already filed for bankruptcies. You're going to recognize many of the names because you've heard them on the other shows or specifically maybe even on Money Matters show. OK, so in those highly rated CLOs, you won't find a single loan rated triple A, double A or even A. Default correlation, a measure of the likelihood of loans defaulting at the same time. So this is what they're using before. They said, well, real estate doesn't default everywhere. It's very, very localized. Well, it is very localized. However, when you get into uh, the, the economic components and it starts dragging, then it starts getting much larger, much bigger, and it kind of drags everything down. So they're saying, look, there's no way that these things are going to collapse because the likelihood of all of them collapsing at the same time, it's like <laughs> never going to happen. Well, I mean, once in a million years. Well, what the heck are we experiencing now than the beer overflow that uh, only happens once in a million years, right? That entire world is shut down. The entire world economy is going down. And, you know, it's it's all starting to like roll out one at a time. Right. We're seeing entire industries being wiped out, not just a single business. It's not a business that may or may not be performing well. It's entire industries that are getting smashed, completely smashed. Underlying loans were too risky and everyone knew that some of them would default, but it seemed unlikely many of them would default at the same time. And they're basically saying, hey, it's spread around. It's not going to happen. But I'm saying it will happen. 
In theory, CLOs are constructed in such a way to minimize the chances that all of the loans will be affected by a single event or chain of events. However, when those were created, nobody thought about, hey, there could potentially be a B overflow component in life that could last for months or if not even years and that we might not have necessarily a solution for. So, you know, they're going to shut down the countries and uh, the travel and the supply chains and everything else and everybody is going to suffer. So look at the list of leveraged borrowers. Here is the list of it. Fitch added to the list of loans of concerns in April, AMC Entertainment. They filed for bankruptcy. Bob's Discount Furniture filed for bankruptcy. California Pizza Kitchen filed for bankruptcy. The Container Store, Land's End, Man's Warehouse, Parody City. So all of these were basically hit super hard even before the, the beer overflow component, right? And you all know what the beer is. It's kind of what we're all experiencing around the world. Why nobody can travel anywhere and then you have to, you know, sit somewhere to for 14 days. Um, would that be like to make sure that your hangover is over? And with that, yeah, 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 to get over your hangover. Um, anyways, so there's two companies with the largest amount of outstanding debt on Fitch's April list were Envision Healthcare, a medical staffing company, um, in uh, Intelstat, which provides satellite broadband access, and Healthmaster, which pro makes products used by restaurants to package food for takeout. So because you were thinking, well, wait a minute, Nev, you know, yeah, sure, over here, but, you know, like, Bob's discount furniture, like nobody's really buying furniture and we know restaurants are suffering and nobody's going shopping. So, of course, the retailers are going down and, uh, you know, nobody's going to the movie theaters. So, of course, they're suffering as well. But, you know, there are other companies like healthcare. You would think that they are thriving. They're not. They're suffering as well. You are thinking that uh, satellite broadband service because that's tech stuff. They're suffering as well. You are thinking that the, the takeout stuff and all of that stuff, but they're suffering as well. So they are actually loan defaults are already happening. They were more in April than ever before, and it will only get worse from here. And I think we're going to experience more and more of that stuff. We have been talking about the fact that many of the companies have been filing for bankruptcy, trying to kind of get out of this stuff. And so now, you know, they're trying to basically save the business. And so while they file for bankruptcy, it does not necessarily always mean that the business is never going to come back. Some don't, some shut down for good, but it means that they're restructuring the loans and stuff. And so it could potentially be that if they're granted that stuff, they're forgiven some of these things. Well, if a bank is closing, holding on to the CLO that is being forgiven, guess what? They're left without their pants on, right? And the tide pulls away, and uh, then you get to see everybody who's swimming naked, as they say. So we could see a lot of nakedness in the future because here is the, the, the problem, right? Banks are hit by these CLOs, but that's not the only problem. We're going to talk about it a little bit more as well. So stay, stay, stick with me. I know it's a long show, but stick with me here on this one, okay? AMC, nearly $2 billion of debt spread across uh, 224 CLOs. Party City, $719 million debt over 183 CLOs or dire straits before uh, physical distancing. Prices of AAA rated CLO layers tumbled in March before Federal Reserve announced that it is additional $2.3 trillion lending would include loans to CLOs. However, as of May, no such loans have been made. The tumble in trial several of the banks to buy the, these things low. Citigroup acquired $2 billion worth of AAA CLOs during the dip, which it flipped for a $100 million profit when prices bounced back. Bank of America reportedly bought a lower layer of CLOs in May for about 20 cents of the dollar. They are all chasing yield because at the end of the day, they have to report earnings in order to continue their stock not collapsing completely. Loan defaults are already happening. We already know that. For the moment, financial system seems relatively stable. Banks can still pay their debt and pass their regular capital tests. However, it is calm before the storm, my humble opinion. Later this summer, leveraged loan defaults will increase significantly as the economy effects of the pandemic fully register. Major of the loans in CLOs have weak covenants that offer investors only minimal legal protection. In industry parlance, they are called light. 
The holders of leveraged loans will thus be fortunate to get pennies on the dollar as companies default, and many won't get anything whatsoever. They will literally lose everything. When I say caught without their pants, I mean gone, no pants, no underpants, nothing. I mean naked, naked. Um, the insurance giant, AIG, which had massive investment in CDOs in 2008, remember them, AIG, is now exposed to more than $9 billion dollars in CLOs. U.S. life insurance companies as a group in 2018 had an estimated one-fifth of their capital tied up in these same instruments. Pension funds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds are all heavily invested in leveraged loans and CLOs. On May 5th, Wells Fargo disclosed $7.7 billion dollars worth of CLOs in a different corner of its balance sheet than the $29.7 billion dollars the author had found in its annual report that was mentioned earlier in the show. Remember all those subsidiaries Enron created, many of them infamously named after Star Wars characters to keep risky bets off their energy firm's financial statements? Well, uh, you had been asking, how does somebody keep something off the balance sheet? That is exactly how you do it. The big banks use similar structure called variable interest entities, companies established largely to hold off the books positions. Wells Fargo had more than $1 trillion dollars of VIE assets, about which we currently know very little because reporting requirements are opaque. One popular investment held in VIE is not just CLOs, but securities backed by commercial mortgages, such as loans to shopping malls and office parks. Ouch. Yeah. So, uh, as you can see, it's not just CLOs, right? This is the part of the problem with the banking sector. They're heavily invested in the CLOs, but there's an even larger problem that is looming, and that is the fact that they're heavily exposed to commercial real estate loans. What do we know about commercial real estate? Well, people are not paying, people are not using, people are defaulting left, right, and sideways, which means that banks are now getting triple squeezed. One, they have to keep showing the product, uh, the profits, right? So they're actually trying to go out there and share that stuff. Then they're exposed to these commercial real estate loans that nobody is paying back and cannot pay back. Then we have this CLO stuff that they're trying to get and hold on to and, and kind of hide off of the different things. As you can see, there's many things that are happening. But here is the problem. The, the whatever economic piece is happening, it's not going away. And we are seeing that the, uh, the prices of these leveraged loans and stuff Um, you know, it's kind of like a sale, right? When one starts going down, next thing you know, the next one goes in and starts firing, and that goes super, super, super fast. At some point, then somebody gets squeezed. They realize, wait a minute, I am over leveraged. I don't have enough money. They start to sell assets. The rumor mill starts over. Nobody wants to, you know, then they say, wait a minute, somebody is, uh, uh, you know, there's some sort of problem, and the overnight lending Uh, starts uh, slowing down and stopping. Remember the repo market? That's one of the reasons kind of how that all happened. Nobody started, uh, uh, people start, uh, banks, not people, banks stopped lending to each other. Next thing you know, the whole thing seizes up. Then Federal Reserve might come in and try to arrange for a bailout. Then they might run over to the government and say, no, 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 no. you know, the, you, you got to print the money. You got to print the money. Financial sector is about to collapse and all of that stuff. Now, here is the part that I think will be different this time around than it was. I could be wrong, but uh, just my sort of thinking. Because before all of this has happened, right, then they ran over, then they were approved for the, the loans and the lending and stuff. You know, nobody was happy about it. Banks got bailed out. Um, you know, and we kind of saved the financial market. Um, now, you know, that might not be as desirable to do. But then again, it's a huge risk. But here is one thing that Fed is doing differently now than it was doing before. And they are tweaking with the Fed coin. Remember that? They're going to go digital to potentially eliminate that stuff. So what could potentially happen, depending on when it happens, depending on how quickly this Fed coin could roll out and all these different things, right? So there's multiple things that could roll out. Uh, there is a potential, and uh, I don't know how probable it is, but there is a possibility, and a strong possibility, that uh, the Fed just might say, you know, forget it, man. We're not bailing you out. You're on your own. We're just going to go roll out our own thing, and that's that. We're just going to uh, swiftly and efficiently eliminate the banks, and that could be, uh, could be a solution. 
financial sector isn't like other sectors. If it fails, fundamental aspects of modern life could fail with it. We could lose ability to get loans, buy a house, car, pay for college. And if the banks fell right into the bad behavior of the last crash, taking many risks, hiding that complex insurance, off balance sheet entities, da, 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 they're doing the exact same stuff now that they used to do before, except it's worse and bigger right now. But over here, they're actually talking about that financial sector, you know, we could lose all of this stuff and it's highly problematic. Here is the part where Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies kind of step in because with cryptocurrencies, you actually can make money. You can buy, you can sell, you can trade, you can uh, loan, you can borrow, you can save, uh, you can earn interest. So you can do a lot of the stuff outside of the traditional financial system inside the cryptocurrency system. This is the reason why the cryptocurrencies, why Bitcoin, why Ethereum, why the IELTS, why the DEXs, why all of the DeFi, all of the stuff that is being created is incredibly important and why you should pay attention to it and why you should consider investing some money in there as well. So as you can see, this was an incredibly important show and you know it is kind of doomy and gloomy when you read this article but i don't think of it as doomy and gloomy because i look at that stuff and say you know cool if that's what you want to do that's fine with me i'm gonna do me you do you and what do i do well i do get a little bit into precious metals just in case you never know you know whatever um, it doesn't hurt, especially not in the uncertain times. It tends to perform really well. And you can always exchange it for good services and other fiat currencies whenever you want to, right? So that's an easy one. Um, cryptos, super huge, super bullish on cryptos. Because when I look at this stuff and say, well, could financial sector implode? Could the Fed coin show up? And we talked about the reasons why it could be a huge security risk. That makes me super bullish on a Bitcoin and on altcoins and on everything else. So that's kind of what I am doing to protect myself. I don't know what you will do. Let me know in the chat. Let me know in the comments. And do make sure you smash that like button so that we can help more people get out of some of the traditional banking stuff. I'm not saying, you know, sell the farm and put everything into Bitcoin or into gold or into anything else. I'm just saying you definitely want to think about diversifying your portfolio and think a little bit differently and into the future. Don't just take their word on it saying that it's safe and it doesn't have any risk because what are they going to tell you? Panic? They're never going to say that. They're never going to say that because they can't. The only time where they will say stuff is when it happens and it's too late for us to act. And we don't want to do that stuff. You want to act right now before everybody else and before all of this stuff rolls out. Thanks for watching. Until next time, stay forever money blessed. And do remember, you are only one deal away.